Hello, Bayside family, and welcome to the second week of our Bayside Sermon Series podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Duckworth. This week, Pastor Ken preached on Daniel chapter 2, and our special guest this week is Miriam Nevis. So, Pastor Ken, let's get right into it. Our main point for today was how Christians react to crisis. Two points that were made for us. And the question was, what do you do when all hope seems lost? So, Pastor Ken, you brought up the two points. When all hope seems lost, those far from God fall down in fear. When all hope seems lost, those close to God rise up in faith. So my two main points were, as you mentioned, um, but my introduction kind of getting everybody to start thinking about the text was that that opening question, uh, what do you do when the bottom falls out? Um, you know, what do you do when uh, all hope seems lost? So obviously for Nebuchadnezzar, he had this uh, a series of dreams that were just uh, disturbing him. Um, and then in the latter half of the chapter, we learn what that dream was. The dream um, was of this uh, huge human statue uh, made of varying degrees of precious metals. Um, and then a stone that is carved out not by human hands rolls down and crushes this a huge human statue. So, you know, it's not till the second half of the chapter that we learn why Nebuchadnezzar was so um, fearful and how he responded uh, to his fear in anger and paranoia um, and even threats of uh, dismemberment for all of his advisors who were uh, completely powerless to interpret the dream. Um, so, um, yeah, so that was that was kind of the, the thrust, uh, kind of focusing a little bit on Nebuchadnezzar. And then we uh, contrasted that with Daniel's response. Daniel uh, rose up in faith. Um, and we saw, um, and, and we'll discuss a little bit of what it looked like for Daniel to rise up in faith. And then um, ultimately how, uh, as followers of Christ, um, we should rise up in faith as well. Mm. Uh, not because we're... Danielians, <laughs> but because we're Christians, ultimately Daniel is not the hero of the story. Yeah. Um, Christ is the hero of the story, as he is um, with every story in Scripture. Um, but yeah, and we'll, we'll we'll discuss that I'm sure soon. Great. So those those two things aren't aren't black and white. That to say that those that are close to God don't fall down in fear. There that does happen. Uh, there's some biblical examples of those who did fall from uh, did fall down in fear. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, the, they tried to hide from God there in the garden. King Saul, after the spirit had lifted off of him and been placed with David as the successor, King Saul sought out a medium because God wasn't answering his prayers. God was not communicating with him to tell him how to proceed in battle. And so he, he went to a medium to, to, to try to, to communicate with the dead. Judas is another example of, of what happens when you, you seem to have no other path. And what choice do you have to make when you're, when you're faced with those fears? And, of course, Peter, out, out on the water, when he takes his eyes off of Jesus, immediately starts to sink. So to say that those things do happen to Christians, one of the things I want to quickly talk about just to put a plug in there is for the Christian counseling that Bayside offers. Foundations is what it's called. There should be a link uh, in the show notes, but it's uh, easily found in our Bayside app as well as in the, the website. Yeah, so that's a good, um, good point, good plug there too. You know, Nebuchadnezzar fell down in fear, and that's not to say that followers of Christ will never experience uh, days, moments, maybe even seasons of being afraid. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the difference is, um, is one of perpetuity, you know, how, um, how long Nebuchadnezzar uh, 
had his, his fear and also his response to it. He never got around uh, to turning to God, um, other than toward the very end of the chapter when he uh, praises Daniel and praises Daniel's God, um, mm-hmm. because uh, he clearly saw that Daniel's God, uh, the God of Israel, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, our God, is the one uh, true God. Um, his theology was still a little off because he thought it, he was the greatest of the gods. He wasn't a monotheist uh, like Daniel was, like we are. He was a polytheist. But um, but yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. There are absolutely seasons, devastating seasons, um, even some seasons that might not be uh, devastating to other people, but might be to us where we do need help, where we need um, outside help, biblical help. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so, you know, you'd mentioned the Foundation's Christian Counseling. And that is, um, that's a Christian organization that Bayside Chapel has partnered with. And we have an office uh, here at Bayside. So if anybody's listening, like uh, Marcus said, you can go to the show notes, um, or you could also um, just go to their website. It's foundchristcouncil.org, foundchristcouncil.org. And from there, uh, you could put in a request to meet with any of uh, any one of the counselors that we have at Bayside mm. um, through foundations. But yeah, absolutely, there are certainly seasons of time. You know, you mentioned Peter and that was clearly that that moment of fear was uh, clearly used for his good as it strengthened his faith uh, in in later days um, through, throughout all of his his life as a disciple and then um, especially after Christ's resurrection. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. That that the fact that Nebuchadnezzar fell down in faith does not mean that those who are close to God won't ever uh, ex- or fell down in fear. That doesn't mean that those close to God won't ever experience. Uh, times of of fear or failure um or or hope hopelessness i mean that's um, hopelessness obviously for the christian is um there is no such thing um but seeming hopelessness mm-hmm. is a very real thing um and I things think that, that's that okay feel hopeless to feel that way oh certainly. at times like we all have those moments in our lives where we've we can look back and we could say we've been through something where we felt hopeless yeah. or so having each other you know, to lean on and having counseling is okay. Yeah. Uh, would you think that, would you say that there was a time in Jesus's life where he um, felt hopeless? Obviously he knew he wasn't, but where he may have felt that. Yeah. When he was crying out to the father. Yeah. Right. In mm-hmm. the garden. Yeah. That's, that's the, absolutely what I think of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was. You and, see and his was, human. Yeah. Aspects there. Yep. Yeah. You, you see, you see Christ in his um, full fledged manhood. Yeah. Um, crying out to the Father, take this cup from me. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a seemingly hopeless situation mm-hmm. that Christ experienced. And then, obviously, the way he perfectly handled it in faith, the statement that followed was, yet not my will but yours be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. So one of the things through this dream that uh, Daniel will, will talk about is the providence of God in the dreams. And what dreams mean to us in the present day and what dreams meant to the pagan nations, especially back then, was a little different. We just studied, again, uh, the previous sermon series was Joseph and Joseph and Pharaoh. There was a, a, a lot of discussion about dreams there. Can you remind the people the importance of dreams to, to people like Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, great question. Um, as with... Um... Pharaoh in Egypt during the days of Joseph and his adventures there. Um, So it was with Nebuchadnezzar, as it was with most ancient pagan kings. They believed their gods spoke to them primarily through dreams. So when Nebuchadnezzar has this startling dream, he's... Um, most likely thinking the gods are trying to communicate something to me. Um, and it looks like I might be this statue and I there's another enemy rising up that's going to destroy me. And it seems like this is what the gods might be communicating to me, but they're not making it clear. So therefore, I have a bunch of people that I pay for these kinds of things and I'm going to bring all of my advisors in and not only ask them to interpret the dream, but because I want to make sure that they really are communicating with the gods like they say they do, I'm going to put it on them to also let me know what my dream was. 
Yeah, so that that was a a, a very special task. So he, he felt threatened by whatever this dream meant, but he's not going to tell the the interpreters what the dream was. And that's that's you know, not really fair to them, but I think there's something maybe a little bit more under the surface. Uh, do we do we know about how many years in reign Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had been in power at this point? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Um, right at the beginning of Daniel two, uh, it says uh, right there in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Um, so the second year, obviously, that's referring to his second full year. So his first year was really um, his uh, year of ascension, um, but that they don't call they never referred the year of ascension as the first year. So his first year was actually his second year, and his second year was actually his third year. So this was really his second full year, or you know, partially his third year reigning. So this is all new to him. Uh, he's you know he's just kind of getting real popular expanding his his empire um and and he's afraid yeah one of the the reasons he's telling his his seers his his mediums you know i'm not telling you my dream because i think you're waiting for the next king i think you're 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 scheming against me and that's mm -hmm. that's why i'm not going to tell you ahead of time because you're just going to tell me what i want to hear and mm -hmm. not tell me the truth yeah, that's a really good observation. In fact, in verse 8 of chapter 2, um, when a second, there was a second time where the advisor said, well, hey, king, tell, tell us your dream, and then we'll tell you its interpretation. And it says in verse 8, the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you're trying to gain time, because you see that the word for me is firm. And when he's saying the word for me is firm, he's talking about their execution, you know, their their the threat of dismemberment. If they can't, uh, interpret this he's going to dismember them but so he says you're you're trying to gain time you're you're just trying to, to push me off um and you are trying to make as much time go on as possible and yeah so that's a good point All right, let's shift the conversation a little bit towards daniel now the the example that you, that you use was that those that are close to god rise uh, up in faith for a lot of us, we, we sometimes tend to be more like Job than Daniel. Uh, we grieve in the moment, which is which is good and, and healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we start to complain about what God is letting bad things happen to us when we've done all these good things. And that's not how Daniel reacts. Uh, so why do you think Daniel was so calm in that moment? I think Daniel had a very, very, very clear understanding mm. of the sovereignty of yes. God. Um, when you are absolutely convinced that God is in control, mm -hmm. not only in control of your life, but in control of all of those around you who seemingly control your life, mm -hmm. when you know that there's nothing they can do to you that will be outside of what God has decreed mm -hmm. and what God will allow, absolutely. there is uh, a lot of comfort uh, that that comes from that. And that is really one of the things that I think bolsters uh, Daniel's faith, as it did uh, Joseph, um, you know, the, that's that's another uh, prime example of faith in God's sovereignty. One of the things that that um, Daniel does is he shares this with his three friends. If you could remind us of those names, because you're better at saying those Hebrew names than I am. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah, who obviously, uh, again, they're it's using their Hebrew names here, but they were known in Babylon as um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and by the way, if you are listening to this, please do not feel bad. If you're like, oh, I don't even, I just know them by their Babylonian names. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. I did like a, it was, it may have been a recent Christmas, maybe even as recent as like last Christmas where we were doing Bible trivia and the question came, what were the Hebrew names of Daniel's three friends? And I didn't know them. So <laughs> I, I, I learn more and more and more as I preach more and more and more because it requires me to study more and more and more. And it's such an amazing privilege. So, so, just, well, just so, so don't feel today, bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> but we see from this the importance of sharing concerns. So Daniel brings it to his friends and says, hey, let's all pray together. And and that that helped, you know, again mm -hmm. with his faith, 
you know, to, to know exactly what, you know, God was wanting for him. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for us, that's a great example. When we have troubles in life, mm -hmm. don't, don't hold it in. Yeah. You know, bring it to your, your fellow brothers, mm -hmm. pray together. Yep. That's, that's, that's what we're, we're here for. That we're in community together. Yep. And I think that immediate response to prayer shows that we understand that it's not in our control and it's automatically in the father's hands. Good point. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a, an absolute demonstration of what we truly believe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, bringing it, bringing it to God. Um, yeah, knowing at that point, you know, I had quoted somebody on Sunday that talked a little bit about the difference between believing prayer is important. You know, everybody believes prayer is important, mm -hmm. um, but few believe it's essential. Mm -hmm. An essential meaning that there's nothing that will happen without mm -hmm. prayer, and clearly that's what Daniel believed. Um, and I think that the even before he prayed, it's his statement to uh, Ariok, who was the essentially the, the king's commander, the, the lead executioner. Um, his statement to Ariok, I think, demonstrated um, his faith, uh, and then or, or showed his faith. And then you see what what it looked like for that faith to be worked out when he started praying. But it was in verse sixteen where it says, after he uh, he hears from Ariok that him and his friends are going to be killed. Um, Daniel went in, verse 16, uh, Daniel 2, 16, and Daniel went in and requested the king appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So right at the beginning, before he even started praying, he had such faith to say, all right, I just need a little bit of time and then I'll show you the interpretation. Um, mm. Because he was that confident in the way God had gifted him. And again, this is not, <laughs> it's, it's really important that we understand that we're not Daniel um, and that's... If someone comes to you with a, a dream, you know, don't claim it in faith that you're going to interpret that dream. Because remember what we saw last week in Daniel chapter one, some of the ways God um, blessed uh, and, and, sh and honored the faith of Daniel and his friends, um, putting them in, in, uh, in positions of leadership, granting them certain things. But it, it, there's also a little bit there where it says, um, and he gave to Daniel the ability to interpret dreams mm, and visions. Mm -hmm. So this was a specific gift that Daniel had. Um, but you see him exercising that gift in faith uh, in that verse. And then, you know, the rest of the chapter goes on to show how that faith was um, even further uh, exercised and realized. The first one being, you know, his, his response of prayer. And another response he had was his psalm. So what do we learn about God from Daniel's psalm? Yeah, that's it's it's a really really cool psalm that starts in verse twenty. Um, it says Daniel answered. So Daniel prays. Um, he and his friends pray. Then all of a sudden, Daniel is able to just rest in God's presence. He actually goes to sleep, um, and it was during his sleep when God revealed, uh, gave him the, the, that vision, revealed both the dream and its interpretation. Daniel wakes up uh, before he even rushes to the king in haste. To reveal the dream and the interpretation, he takes time to praise God. So verse 20, um, he starts and says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. So right there, you, he's he's mm. praising God for his eternality, the, the name of God forever and ever, God with no beginning and God with no mm. end. And he says, to whom belong wisdom and might. So he's a God of wisdom. You know, he knows how to order the world perfectly for his great purposes mm. Uh, to be realized. Um, and he's a God of might. Um, so he alone has the power to carry out his wise purposes because um, wisdom necessitates strength uh, if that wisdom is to be uh, realized. Um, verse uh, 21. Miriam, I'll read verse 21. Tell me a little bit of maybe what, what you see. Mm -hmm. It says, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Mm -hmm. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So anything in there that, that you might say about God's character? Well, it's funny because I actually put that in my notes this morning, um, that he removes kings and sets up kings. That's just a perfect example. If we just kind of look at it from outside in the God view, seeing that whatever happened and what's going on is fully in his control and that he's in charge of it all. Yep. Yeah. So I really like that. Um, and I think very practically, that kind of um, understanding of God's sovereignty, um, that he's the one who removes kings, he's the one mm. who sets up kings, 
should really um, inform the way we as believers even approach uh, something like uh, local and national elections. Absolutely. We see people, believers, get so fearful during those times when the mm-hmm. person they voted for um, doesn't win. And, mm-hmm. and it's understandable to, to, to an extent right. because we want to see someone leading the country yeah. who at least very minimally has mm-hmm. some biblical convictions. Mm-hmm. Um, but when that doesn't happen, right. it's the response of believers sometimes that concerns me. Yes. Um, but I think it's what we can see here from Daniel is that we know who actually will win every single election. Mm-hmm. It's whoever God wants and puts in place. Absolutely. Um, and so there's just a, there's a, just a comfort and hope mm-hmm. that comes from that. Mm-hmm. Um, that you know that God is always going to put the person in office who He wants to put in office. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that person in office is going to be a godly leader. We see that all the time with mm-hmm. Old Testament um, right. uh, kings. But we um, also see God use it. <laughs> exactly. And that's the and that's the whole point yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. That God will promise, mm-hmm. that God has promised mm-hmm. to use all of it. Yeah. That's a good point. I think just the way the world is today, you know, I think a lot of Christians are feeling, you know, pressured and feeling down and like, you know, seeing things not going the way they think it's supposed to go or whatever, but knowing that God is fully in control, that's just such a relief for us because yep. we can just sigh relief there and not have to worry about it. And what an incredible example it is to our children. Yeah. When they don't see us um, fretting over the things um, all the anchors on Fox News are fretting. And I'm, mm. I'm saying Fox News because I know that's probably who most will listen to, but any mm. news anchor, mm-hmm. um, when... <laughs> Our children don't see us getting so upset and bent out of shape by what's happening around us, but instead constantly Mm. pointing them to the fact that there is a God in heaven who rules and reigns. There is a a Jesus of heaven who sits Mm. at the right hand of the Father Mm. and everything is under his feet and he controls it all. Yeah. Come what may. (laughs) He's in control. That's right. And you said right there in... I think it's verse 21, that it's God who gives wisdom to the wise. Uh, you may claim to be wise, but if, if it's not God giving you that wisdom, then uh, you're, you've got some false ideas of what mm. your wisdom truly is. That's right. Yeah, good point. <clears throat> mm-hmm. All right, so let's shift a little bit to talking about this dream. Uh, could you describe again uh, the makeup of the statue, uh, the different parts? Yeah, so... Um... He, uh, all, all of a sudden, you know, so uh, after he praises God, he then goes to uh, Arioch and says, um, hey, don't destroy any, don't destroy us and our friends, but don't destroy any of the wise men. Um, uh, and that's a great point that he, he didn't just say, save my friends, kill everybody else. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's okay. Just get, I don't want any competition yep, that's here. That's right. And yeah, exactly. He, he, he shows humility and, and compassion and he's a good leader he doesn't lord it over the pagan wise men um because he really could have used this as an opportunity for selfish gain mm-hmm. um but he's just uh, he's he's humble and, and compassionate and then eventually he when he does uh, tell the dream uh the first thing um he goes the king says hey are you able to make known to me this dream because Arioch brings him brings daniel to the to the king and daniel <laughs> daniel's first response is well no person can it's not not me no wise man nobody in in your administration can show what you've asked any of us to show but there is a god in heaven who reveals mysteries Mm -hmm. um so daniel first gives all the glory to god Mm -hmm. and then he goes on and says here's what here's the dream you had you saw this great image it was mighty of exceeding brightness its appearance was frightening and its head was gold it had a chest and arms of silver middle and and thighs of bronze it had legs of iron and then its feet were mixed of of part iron part clay and then you see this huge statue and then you see the stone cut out by no human hand strikes this statue on its feet breaks them into pieces and everything else falls on top of this uh this stone and everything just disintegrates and he says it, it became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors so 
for our understanding, like dust in the wind. The wind carried them away. Nothing could be, uh, nothing could be traced. Um, so that, and then he, and then also in that dream, this stone uh, that struck the image um, becomes, uh, it grows and grows and grows and becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. And um, that's where Jesus fits into this dream. Mm-hmm. That is exactly where where Jesus fits into this dream. Um, you know, understanding. And what a what a what a cool image. You know, as I was thinking about this, thinking like, man, if I always some when I'm reading the the, the Hebrew Old Testament, the, the the Bible that even you know that Jews have today as their their full Bibles as our Old Testament. Oftentimes, you think. I, I'm always reading like, oh, how can I convince a Jew of um, that Jesus is the Messiah? Uh, and you know, our brain, my brain always goes to you know some of the the prophecies and like Isaiah 53 and everything. But even with something like this, like Jesus perfectly fulfills mm-hmm. um, who this stone is. In fact, in Matthew, uh, I'll pull that up. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is is giving a parable, and then he, in the context of this parable, he says, "Have you never read in the scriptures?" The stone that the builders rejected Mm -hmm. has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. Um, And it's marvelous in our eyes. And then he goes on and he says, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. That sounds a lot like the stone that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream in Daniel chapter 2. Yeah, I I did a little bit of research on what uh, the function of the cornerstone is. Um, and and in the ancient times, and even what we do today, it's 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 a very visual presentation that everything is built on. It mm. it, it can be ornate, um, or it it's, it makes a proclamation. It says, "Here we are. Here's our foundation, and we're going to grow from there." And 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 that's mm. that's how the the movement of Christianity it's it started with with that cornerstone and. Here we are today, over two thousand years later. Yeah. So yeah, right. The the stone um, that struck the image, you know, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And that whole idea of um, of growing into a great mountain and filling the whole earth is exactly um, what happened um, after Jesus's resurrection. Um, you know, fifty days later, Pentecost happens, and the Holy Spirit falls on the church, and then they go out to the ends of the earth. They they begin going out to the ends of the earth to to grow the kingdom because Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God is here. looks a lot different than the kingdom you thought it was going to look like, um, but the kingdom of God has come. This is what it looks like. And now all my followers are commissioned to spread this message and to grow the kingdom. And Mm. that's where we find ourselves in the year 2022. Still... um, uh, filling the whole earth of the good news of uh, the reign of God's kingdom. That's great news. Okay, so um, as we start to wrap up, uh, there were four steps to rising up in faith that you had in your sermon. If you're following along and, and you have these questions uh, that you need to fill in, one, we were, we res- respond with prayer. The, 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 the first step is that when something happens, we respond with prayer. And next was to rest in God's presence, you know, finding peace in, mm-hmm. in our relationship with God. Rejoice with praise, whether if it's the outcome we desire or, mm-hmm. or not, it's, it's the outcome that God has set forth uh, in his sovereignty that, we're gonna, that we need to rejoice with praise. Mm-hmm. And to rely on God's promises that God has his will and he is going to do his will through completion and we need to rely on him to be a, a good God. Uh, and for those of you that are following along, that it's R and P. Uh, each, each, that was a, a nice, again, acrostic uh, way to help remember it. This, this, is, this is just a, a, a normal uh, way that most sermons are built is to help with with repetition and and and, and remembering and just kind of solidifying those things. Um, so those are uh, four great steps to helping us remember to rise up in faith. And our big uh, main point of the sermon, uh, what was that again? Yeah, so our big idea um, uh, came at the end of the sermon this time. 
Um, I, I refer to it in the sermon as the bottom line. A lot of times, uh, if you hear myself or Dr. Ritter, um, we will oftentimes, um, if the big idea comes at the end, we'll a lot of times say that here's the bottom line. Um, and kind of just a summary of everything in chapter two, because that's what a big idea does. It's, it takes a, a theological summary of everything, of the whole preaching portion, and um, words it in a timely manner for today's audience and hearers. And the big idea summary was hope can be had in hopeless days because the God of heaven reigns. Mm. Amen. And again, that points us back to the sovereignty of God. Yeah. The sovereignty of God. Yeah. And, and absolutely, you know, his promise um, that because we're still living in the days of of uh, various kingdoms. It looks different than the empires of the past. Um, but we are still living in the days of Earth's kingdoms. But mm -hmm. the promise that Jesus came mm -hmm. in his first coming, mm -hmm. started growing his kingdom, mm -hmm. and he's still growing it. He's delaying his return so because his desire is that all would come to repentance. Um, uh, but he, when he does return, he's coming then to uh, fully realize and um, bring to, um, to fullness his rule, his reign. Um, and and clearly, just as uh, Babylon is no more, as uh, the Medes and the Persians are, are no more, as Greece is no more, as the Roman Empire is no more, those are now all dust mm -hmm. in the wind. Mm -hmm. um, all of the nations um, that are in our midst today or that, that we live in um, and serve God in as citizens of heaven, those two will uh, one day become dust in the wind. Mm. Awesome. All right, so now's the part where we talk about the director's cuts. What what did not make it into the sermon, if there was anything you wanted to bring up? Um, prob I think mostly what didn't make it into the sermon um, was pro were probably just um, some points of application or uh, maybe even some personal stories that I may have uh, uh, wanted to talk about, but for the sake of time, a lot of times I'll, I'll kind of think of some personal stories that I could relate and then a lot of times by the time I'm done working on the sermon, I realize I have, um, I'm going to take up a lot more time than is allotted. So what I end up cutting out are usually those personal anecdotes simply because I always prioritize uh, scripture above my, my personal stories. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of that. Um, content but, in yeah, the context. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there was not a whole lot um, of anything in the, the text itself. Um, that I had to leave out, other than the last few verses, which I completely left out and didn't even touch on. Um, the last few verses uh, show the result of uh, Daniel um, inter uh, interpreting, uh, bo both telling the king what the dream was and then offering the, providing the interpretation of that dream. Um, Daniel is, is praised and Daniel's God is praised. And then Daniel basically says, um, hey, let's, could we use this as an opportunity? I know you're going to promote me, but um, can you also promote my, my friends? Um, and the king does that. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool ending up to the story that we didn't, to this chapter that we didn't even touch on in the sermon. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that, uh, is available in our app as, as you're listening to the sermon on Sundays, you can go into the notes and then click on a hyperlink to allow you to ask a question in the podcast. Uh, this week we had one question uh, from the congregation. And uh, Miriam, would you mind reading that for us? Yeah, absolutely. How or where did all the powerful civilizations originate from? Seems like they came from nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, outside the scope of Daniel chapter 2. Um, but... Remember, this is taking place now around, you know, six, I guess, if Nebuchadnezzar destroyed uh, uh, his first inv invasion of Jerusalem was in 605 B.C. This is taking place around uh, 603 or so B.C. Uh, so at that time, um, historians refer to Babylon at, during this time as Neo, uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire um, because there was a... a Babylonians uh, at one point existed, you know, even like 1400 years before this, um, but then fizzled out and then um, were resurrected again during this time. Uh, but I think the best answer to that question is, is um, 
from the biblical uh, biblical viewpoint is really um, understanding the, the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babel um, in that you see in Genesis that you learn about a lot in Genesis ten and eleven. Um, you know, at that time, the descendants of Noah were all speaking one language, um, and they were. Uh, God had commanded them be fruitful and multiply. He wanted them to spread across the earth um, and to inhabit um, his creation um, even after um, the, the destruction of the flood. So they don't do that, and they, cre- they want to build this uh, tower um, to make a name for themselves. Um, and it was as a result of that where God begins to scatter them so if looking at some timelines and again these are loose dates not set in stone and i say they're not set in stone because you could infer a lot of it from scripture but it's not stated explicitly in scripture so it's Mm. therefore it's not scripture um uh, but uh, a general understanding is that around 2240 bc is when babel happened um all the events there and then it gives essentially the lineage of noah's sons and grandsons and so forth and so on. Um, so it was, if that happened 2240 BC, um, even secular historians uh, date um, the first Babylon to 10 years after that, around 2230 uh, BC. So that's when it's all this, the civilization started. And then uh, Egypt in the, the 2100s, um, even the earliest uh, versions of Greece um, in, in the 2000s. Um, so you really have everything. Um, I think the best way to make sense of all civilizations is you, everything goes back to to Babel. Um, what's interesting is that the Tower of Babel was likely um, uh, what's called a, a ziggurat. Um, and kind of a pyramid. Yeah, and it looks a lot like a pyramid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really a bit the biblical viewpoint is in worldview it just makes sense of so much that you see um because scattered from uh babel then or uh babylon then uh, the tower of babel would have been all of these different peoples who then progressed and started to make uh, bigger civilizations um and you would naturally see it that it would it would start every everything would start in the middle east and then slowly expand and that's exactly what world history tells us mm-hmm. um things started there and slowly expanded but that makes sense for the things like the pyramids of egypt where did they get their designs from well mm-hmm. likely from the tower of babel that makes sense for all of these pyramid like structures which um, popped up all over the world eventually. You have some um, in Guatemala, Peru, uh, mm-hmm. India. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the most well-known ones are the ones in Egypt. There are also uh, some in Mexico. There's some in China. Um, but it all comes out from here. In fact, there's a lot of uh, a lot of these nations have kind of in genealogical studies, um, and you know, even there, it's funny cause there are even some, uh, there's a, some ancient Chinese historians who date, who date back their civilization, going back to Noah and his three sons. Yeah. Um, so it really does mm-hmm. makes a kind of understanding what happened at Babel and then the scattering really makes sense of these, um, nations, these empires, these civilizations that may seemingly have just popped into existence from nowhere, but, um, but they didn't as they grew over time. Um, then they rose in power. And then um, when they started rising in power, as fallen humans do, they want to uh, gain more and more power, more and more fame, more and more wealth. So yeah. then they start conquering other nations. Mm-hmm. And um, and then that's how those civilizations, those empires um, get even bigger. Great. And that's the purpose of this podcast is to, to get some deeper background information. Mm-hmm. Uh, so next week, uh, Daniel three, uh, is is that the the furnace? Is uh, be Daniel, a hot one? yeah, Daniel, it's, yeah, that's right, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, next week's going to be a hot one. Uh, Doctor Ritter, um, he won't call himself Doctor Ritter, um, but I will. <laughs> he'll be preaching on Sunday, um, and so he'll be the one on the podcast next week. But yeah, so this is you know the the famous text of. The fiery furnace, um, where um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or uh, Mishael, Azariah, and Hananiah, um, are cast into the fiery furnace. 
um, because um, they refuse to bow down, worship, pray to um, the king. Um, so God does some pretty incredible things to spare them and mm-hmm. to draw attention to his might and his glory. Mm, so, I heard there was another in the fire. There was another in the fire. <laughs> yep, standing next to me. Yep. That's <laughs> <laughs> also a plug for one of the songs we'll be doing on Sunday. <laughs> and will there be any VeggieTale references this week? I can't say. Okay. Knowing uh, <laughs> Pastor Dave, maybe. <laughs> all right. Well, that's our time for today. Uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, again, thank you, Pastor Ken and Miriam, for joining us today. And we appreciate you, you uh, stopping and taking a break from your week. And that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. This has been the Bayside Chapel Sermon Series Podcast. Next week, join us again with Pastor Dave Ritter, where we will be discussing Daniel chapter 3. Remember to check in with the Bayside app and look through the notes for this Sunday's sermon and be ready to submit any questions you might have for the podcast. Thank you very much and have a blessed week.